everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah, you can hear me. Perfect. Hello, everyone. And so this is a talk about transatlantic transatlantic relations. Uh, before I start, I just want to say everyone that as Katka mentioned, this is a parallel session going on as well. So if you listeners are hearing so two different things, you have to switch off one of the windows, hopefully not the one we are at, or just refresh. So just a little housekeeping rule here. So transatlantic relations beyond repair is the topic or the name of this topic we're going to discuss now, a very pertinent topic, I would say. And I think it's quite fair to say that in the last four years, uh, Europe and United States have not really seen eye to eye on really anything from the Iran nuclear deal, China, Russia, climate change, WTO or even the WHO. And you could almost hear a sort of collective sigh of relief from most European capitals when it was clear that Biden had won. However, though, I mean, after all, what we can see is that it wasn't a clear sweeping victory many expected. Uh, Governance in the uh, United States is still very much divided. We can also maybe talk about the disunited states at the moment. And of course, we have a precedent that still haven't conceded. But even beyond that, uh, if you look back at before 2016 and the Trump presidency, they were clear that there were some tensions in the transatlantic relations that I think perhaps have become even bigger uh, since President Trump. So the question we're really going to ask now is, is transatlantic relations really beyond repair? Um, and who I have with me now is four speakers that I believe are experts in this. We couldn't really have asked for a better panel. We have in Brussels, James Pacherai, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs. I always trip over that title, but uh, thank God not this time. Uh, also the Special Representative of the Southern Caucasus at NATO. Uh, and an old, uh, really, if anyone has followed NATO in the last decade or two, you know how important James is for that alliance. We also have the State Secretary at the MFA in Riga, Latvia, Andris Pels. Uh, Andris has also been a diplomat who's been posted in Brussels, both at the, at the permanent representation at NATO and in the EU as well. We have my Swedish compatriot, Anna Wislander, who is obviously the uh, Director for Northern Europe at the Atlantic Council and someone who is really an expert on everything transatlantic. And last, but absolutely not least, my old sparring partner from Brussels, uh, Stephen Blockmans, who is uh, the uh, head of EU foreign policy and institutional affairs as one of the most foremost uh, think tanks in Brussels, CEPs, and also a professor at the University of Amsterdam. Guys, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, before I start and ask, uh, with the introduction here, we, we're going to ask, there is a Slido question for you viewers here. Uh, it's a sort of questionnaire we should answer yes or no. And the question is, should the EU still pursue its strategic autonomy? Yes or no? We will see. There's a little poll going on. And of course, you're already free right now to send questions in. Um, there's going to be a little intro here. We're going to talk a little bit with the four, but then I really want to open uh, the floor for questions. So please send in your questions already now. James, uh, I will start with you. Of all the institutions that seem to really struggle in the last four years, I have a feeling, looking from the outside, that NATO was maybe the one. Uh, we heard a lot of critical comments about the alliance uh, by President Trump, even though I think that you know, towards the end of his presidency, uh, he seemed to get on very well with Mr. Stoltenberg and he seemed to be, you know, saying nicer things about NATO. But is, what do you say, is the transatlantic relationship beyond repair? And is maybe NATO even beyond repair? Uh, Ricard, thank you for that question and uh, thank you for the invitation and it's great to be here. I'm realizing now for the first time why when I was spokesman, the makeup lady put uh, makeup on the top of my head, uh, so I apologize <laughs> for the glare uh, there. But um, let me um, turn straight to your question. And I, I have been reminded over these past four years uh, of a quote from uh, Samuel Johnson, where he says, uh, marriage has many pains, but celibacy has no pleasures. And I, I think we've had many of the pains of marriage over the last four years uh, without uh, unfortunately, a, a marriage counselor. But uh, I think also both sides of the Atlantic have been painfully aware uh, that celibacy is not an option, uh, that we cannot 
stand separately, uh, that we can only stand together. And I think these last four years have really highlighted that. Um, because we have, while going through all of these challenges, also, I think, come to a really shared view that um, what some people call the democratic West, of which NATO is a, a central pillar and of which NATO members are, are central pillars, is under a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of military threat, as Russia has substantially developed its weapon systems, has violated arms control treaties, has deployed these intermediate range nuclear forces, um, missiles into uh, into European territory, et cetera, et cetera, but also systemic challenges, challenges to our populations from uh, people trying to interfere with how they see uh, security issues and each other, uh, interference into the democratic systems, uh, attempts to influence the international bodies that set norms and standards, for example, when it comes to internet freedom or when it comes to human rights. So we really recognize that uh, over these past four years, we've come under a lot of pressure and we need to stand together. So that's sort of one thing that has kept the marriage, I think, uh, pretty strong. The, the second thing I'd say is that actually it hasn't been all complication. And um, you quite rightly highlighted some of the stresses. I would note that despite all the sort of tough rhetoric coming from uh, Washington in particular, uh, when it comes to NATO, for example, uh, the US has actually increased its military presence in Europe. It has increased the amount of money it spends on the defense of Europe, increased the number of exercises. Uh, I'd say actually that we have a growing convergence when it comes to China on the recognition of the challenges. Of course, there are also opportunities. And uh, we've seen just uh, recently in Asia a trade deal over the last couple of days that show some of those opportunities. But uh, there are challenges. And, and I can see the allies coming closer together and in many ways coming closer to the U.S. Uh, position on China. Um, we have agreed on a lot here in the last four years together across the Atlantic on space, on emerging and disruptive technologies, uh, on, on our operations. Um, and I think all the allies, you know, the rhetoric's been difficult, but they've all recognized that they need to spend more on defense. Uh, and I think that's gonna continue under a new administration. So I'm just gonna now preface the next two points uh, on the assumption that there is indeed um, uh, a new administration. Uh, and I'd say these two things. Just as you said, I think we all expect a lot of the fundamental irritants in the transatlantic relationship, which were kind of outside of the NATO context, to be addressed pretty quickly because uh, President-elect Biden uh, has very clearly said uh, that he intends to change direction when it comes to Iran, when it comes to climate, when it comes to the World Health Organization, when it comes to arms control and extending New START, in general support for multilateralism. Those are big things uh, and they have been big irritants. Hopefully uh, we can expect that they would be addressed relatively quickly. Also, I think we can expect change in tone and in sort of predictability, um, and both of those things will go down well here. But then I would conclude, because I knew you wanted us to be brief, and there are very smart people who also want to speak, that you shouldn't expect some, and we shouldn't expect, don't expect, some fundamentals to change. Uh, whatever administration is in place, the United States is toughening up on China uh, and on the concerns that uh, the rise of China is posing for all of us. I don't expect that to change. Second, the US focus on China and the Indo-Pacific region. I don't expect that to change either. Uh, that is a real concern for the US. I think the US is going to continue to press on defense spending. Uh, that has been a bipartisan issue for decades uh, and that will continue. Um, I think there will probably be continuing disputes over trade. Uh, the EU is going to take decisions on tech companies, which may not go down that well in, in the United States. So we shouldn't expect that now, you know, goodbye to uh, difficulties across the Atlantic and everything will be back to hugs and kisses. That won't be the case. But I think a lot of irritants will be removed. 
the tone and predictability will improve. Uh, and the general consensus that we have here, that we need to stand together to defend not just our security, but our values and the systems on which they depend against a lot of challenges, including a growing Russia and China convergence. I think that's going to be a very solid foundation on which we can rest for the next few years. Thank you. James, thank you very much. Let me assure you, you are as handsome as always. I have a little quick follow-up question. You mentioned defense spending, and that's something that every American president have mentioned and, and sort of pushed Europeans on. In the same time, we're in the middle of a pandemic, which have devastating consequences for, for all economies, really. And we all know that when there is a recession, um, one of the first things that finance ministers usually cut is defense spending. So can we really expect that European countries actually will step up defense spending, even though we see the pandemic going on and the economic downturn coming? So uh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, just this morning we were discussing, or the allies were discussing the budgetary pressures and the implications of that. Uh, and this will only roll on for a few years. It's not going to be a few months, that's for sure. But I, I really actually see that there is an understanding that not that we had been overspending before and now can cut back, but that we almost across the board in NATO had been underspending and that the challenges are growing. And I just highlighted some of them to you. And that if we don't have security, we can also not have economic prosperity. So in the last few months, despite the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, and to a certain extent unsolicited, um, ministers have shared with us, uh, NATO defense ministers, that they intend to keep to their targets, in some case increase. So, uh, I, A, I expect the pressure to continue. You're absolutely right. But second, I really do believe that actually we have internalized this. And your country, um, Anna's country has, uh, you know, not as a NATO member, also come to the conclusion that, you know, we have to do more and pandemic or no pandemic, uh, security uh, matters. And the pandemic has in many ways actually accelerated some of the trends that we saw before the pandemic, including the negative security trends. So it would be a true false economy to cut defense spending. And I think my belief is anyway that uh, most if not all the nato countries have have uh, understood that anna i'll turn to you now uh the trans transatlantic bond has it been weakened beyond repair and do you really think that europeans still can trust the united states richard and thanks for the invitation i'm happy to be here by really <laughs> Um, but uh, this is how it goes these days. So uh, this topic, I think, is very important for Northern Europe, where I sit, and Eastern Europe, of course, uh, the transatlantic relationship. Is it beyond repair? And I thought I would start with just uh, President Eisenhower. I love this quote from him. Freedom's greatest requirement is unity, the unity which is the very lifeblood of NATO. And I think when we assess where we are now, are we beyond repair or not? We have to look at the unity uh, aspect of this. And I want to highlight uh, what I see as one, one thing that we sometimes do not talk about that much. You mentioned the political turbulence. We're all aware of that, of course, that has uh, characterized these past four years on NATO, on trade, the Iran deal, arms control, and so on. But uh, I think it's also that we have to take into account uh, a general U.S. fatigue, as I call it, all over Europe. And you can see it on the public polls showing record low ratings for the U.S. in the U.K., in France, in Germany. Overall, in many EU member states, the majority have had an unfavorable view of the U.S. And on the other side of the Atlantic, less interest and engagement in Europe. Uh, has been a long-term trend. You can see only 13% of the Americans see Germany as an important partner, for instance. So I think we also need to have a view of the public, since we are all uh, uh, working within democracies here, 
how do we how do we uh, address this when we take account of the unity and then of course uh, there are the other aspects the other tendencies as james pointed out uh, primarily on the military side where we have had a lot of engagement from the trump administration uh, increased deterrence towards russia investments in more troops on the ground infrastructure preposition of material exercises so this are plus and minuses but overall i think there definitely has been a quite severe drift across the atlantic these past four years uh, and you can see that uh, as it is reflected in these calls for europe to increase autonomy and this is good in the way that it reflects uh, the sense that Europe must take on more responsibility for its security. But it's bad in the sense that uh, it sometimes reaches So both good and bad in that. And since the election, I've heard from other parts of Europe actually arguments that, you know, it's, it's not perhaps um, all, all uh, happy notes on Biden. You, you can hear arguments such as Biden is Trump uh, with a nice face, indicating that this US fatigue will prevail actually, and there's an assumption that can change. Uh, and if you join discussions in Washington DC uh, on the election and foreign policy, they tend to jump to China directly, while we tend to jump to European autonomy directly. And I think this kind of reflects something that we have to acknowledge also that, as you both have said, previous speakers, this will not go back to how it was once. We have uh, moved on during these four years and we have to acknowledge where we are now and take stands to, in order to move forward in, in a constructive way. Uh, so I think uh, that, first of all, of course, uh, Joe Biden is not Donald Trump. <laughs> Uh, Biden is a solid transatlantist, uh, and uh, I was at the Munich Security Conference uh, 2019 when he promised Europe that we will be back, and I think they will, um, as James also elaborated upon. Uh, the Trump administration had no preference in working with Europe. They could if it fitted their interests, but they might as well not. So this will be a difference. I think the Biden administration will seek to have a preference to seek solutions and build trust with Europe ahead. Um, and that will be a big difference. They will also, I believe, have a sober view on Russia. I do not expect them to have uh, a reset uh, on Russia uh, with this administration, although it's always tempting for a new president. But uh, the need for a reset, I hear more frequently from Paris, actually, than from Washington, D.C. And on the European side, many uh, representatives have already reached out, uh, both from the EU institutions and from Berlin, Paris, and for a revitalized transatlantic agenda and a new deal. Uh, and these are, of course, good news that we have such intentions. I think there are excellent opportunities to shape much more of a common agenda now between the U.S. and Europe in the years ahead. And to my mind, uh, that overall vision has to be an agenda to defend the West, to defend democracy, human rights, and free and fair trade against autocracies uh, such as China and Russia, who seek to undermine the rule-based order. And NATO could do more, I think, believe, of global strategic consulta consultation while keeping its operational focus regional. But then this agenda also needs to embrace more of a consensus on Europe's role and responsibility, its capacity to act and to act alone if necessary. That is, if the US doesn't want to or is not able to. Uh, so Europe has to develop its capacity to defend itself, keep defense spending up, but also be smart on its way ahead. Uh, and I believe strongly that uh, NATO needs to start shaping some sort of European pillar within itself. I do not believe in the Macron way of moving towards more European independence, although he has also um, confirmed his, his uh, belief in a European pillar in NATO. So there is common ground here. But I also believe, and this is a very important point, I think, that there can be no credible and realistic European autonomy without the agreement or consent of the US if we want to keep the transatlantic framework. And this has to be both political and military. How do Europeans 
and the U.S. divide the work between them? Who takes the lead when and where and on what issues? And can there be consensus on the level of independence? Those are key issues to address these coming four years. And this is not about feeding fragmentation, as the U.S. sometimes claims. Uh, I think, on the contrary, this is, is about this unity, again, the lifeblood of, of NATO. Uh, in order to maintain this cohesion, you have to recognize the differences and sort them out, because this internal unity will bring uh, external strength and more equal partnership between the U.S. and Europe ahead. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you, you Anna. Uh, just a, a quick question there. You talk about sort of a, a division of labor, about taking the lead yeah. in different questions. W which questions do you think Europe should take the lead at and which questions is better left for, for Washington in a coming Biden administration? I think for, uh, what we have witnessed this year, the conflicts that arise in Europe's uh, on borders or neighborhood, that's, that's very natural for, the, for Europe to engage much more in, to have a stronger stronger muscles, stronger diplomatic skills, and, and perhaps more, more uh, united and, and ready to act. Uh, Belarus, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, even Turkey, Greece is interesting to study, or Turkey, Greece, Cyprus conflict. Uh, on all of this, I think that's natural to, for the EU to step up. Um, it's in its neighborhood, uh, and uh, it's important to have it. You can also look further north, where we are, uh, into the Arctic. Uh, that's a big discussion, what would be the EU's role in the Arctic, and perhaps approach the Arctic more as a, a neighborhood uh, area and issue as well, and connect then and bridge over to NATO in this regard. So I would start, uh, start where we stand and where we have those things affecting us the most. Uh, also, if you combine that with what we all see, that the U.S. is uh, increasingly um, occupied with developments in Asia uh, and I think that's the division of labor that we will have to see but then just to add on I think also for the bigger expeditionary forces of, of Europe uh, and I'm thinking in particular of Germany perhaps I think France and the UK have it, have that mindset already but Germany is stepping up now investing more in its defense also have to ask itself, can they be of help in pursuing uh, American interests in Asia? Uh, I mean, who will guard the Strait of Taiwan, for instance, freedom of navigation? Can Germany send their ships there? Uh, as, as you develop a more uh, a stronger acting role globally, uh, the bigger powers of, of Europe also need to consider uh, what expectations will, will uh, all of the group have on those powers? Sweden can't go there with their Corvettes, for instance, but Germany could go. Thank you, Anna. Andris, uh, turning to you now. Uh, Latvia is a bit of a frontline state, both when it comes to EU and NATO. So how, how do you think, uh, how will Latvia play the new Biden administration? What is the interesting things that are going to come out for it? And how did you perhaps survive the last four years with the Trump administration? Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, it's really um, a very pertinent question. Um, well, when we, when we look uh, at the basics, um, any long uh, lasting partnership, uh, such as uh, Europe, uh, US, um, and, and uh, we, of course, uh, see Latvia as part of it, uh, uh, requires uh, two uh, prerequisites. Uh, one is common values, and the other is um, common interests. On values, uh, do we, um, uh, as Europeans, have any other uh, partner with the reach of the United States uh, that uh, we are closer on values? No, uh, absolutely not. Uh, on interests, uh, do we share the major uh, strategic goals? Uh, yes, and more than with uh, any other any other major player. So I would say that um, uh, on the basic level, uh, the basis for the uh, transatlantic partnership are uh, solid. So to the question, how do the four years of current administration um, look from uh, the perspective of uh, um, smaller uh, country uh, from the north uh, Latvia. Uh, 
I'll touch upon uh, practical cooperation, uh, strategic communications part, and, and, uh, and uh, system uh, shifts. From the practical cooperation point of view, uh, we in Latvia have uh, seen the closest uh, security partnership with the United States ever more than during the Obama administration, uh, which, which in turn was more than during the Bush administration. So it is uh, totally on the right track uh, and uh, right uh, upward trajectory, um, also as uh, James mentioned before. And we expect it to develop further with any new uh, administration. Uh, from a strategic communications point of the view, uh, the approach of the uh, current administration has been um, uh, a bit um, rougher than um, we Europeans have, uh, have used to, uh, have been used to. Uh, still, the message uh, has most of the time uh, been uh, very similar or, or the same, not, not always, of course, but uh, as regards, uh, for example, defense spending, defense capability development, it's, um, it's been there also during the previous administrations and, and that's going to stay. Uh, from the systemic point of view, it, uh, of course, gets a bit more interesting. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, some of the uh, organizations, uh, well, for the Europeans, uh, the uh, rules-based uh, multilateral system is key to our uh, view of international affairs. Uh, we have tried the alternatives, uh, um, and uh, I guess that is the reason why we like the multilateral uh, so much. The issue, uh, as I see it, is that we sometimes put the equation mark between um, uh, multilateralism and the current web of uh, somewhat uh, static uh, international arrangements, while the driver of the creation of the system, the US, um, uh, seems to be uh, increasingly agitated, at least by, by some uh, specific parts of, of this web. Some of uh, this agitation will, um, I would expect, wane with the, with the new administration, but some of that will definitely um, stay, and that will have to be addressed uh, through reforms in, in, uh, in, in this organization uh, uh, as appropriate. The good news, uh, I believe that um, uh, if that is Biden administration, uh, Biden administration would be much more inclined to work on reforms uh, through negotiation rather than uh, through leaving the organizations. So if the premise of today's theme on repairing the re relationship, um, uh, transatlantic relationship, uh, is a desire to return to some previous point in uh, history, uh, that is not realistic. Uh, but we should work on uh, our strategic goals together and uh, the future is uh, by no means clear. Andri, thank you very much. If there is one main strategic goal right now for Latvia when it comes to US as well, what would that be? One. One definitely security. Today is our national day. Uh, it's uh, 102 uh, years since we uh, um, uh, declared our uh, uh, independent and uh, democratic republic, and of course, uh, the basis of uh, any uh, independent uh, and democratic republic is uh, security. And uh, on the security point of view, as I said, uh, the relationship with the U.S. Uh, has been uh, extremely um, uh, fruitful, and uh, also with the other. Uh, NATO partners, and uh, obviously we have a three-pronged uh, three strategy, which is uh, everything that we can do ourselves, everything that we can do within NATO, and uh, obviously uh, everything that we can uh, do together with the United States. And uh, therefore, if I have to be on security, of course. Thank you very much, Andres. Stephen, turning to you, um, the European Commission is currently drawing up uh, a sort of list of topics, items that they want to re-engage with America on. Um, if you were to advise the European Commission on what topics they should re-engage on and on what topics that perhaps they shouldn't talk too much about, but rather do some homework, 
what would those topics be? Right. Thanks, Ricard. It's, it's great to see you here, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I agree with, with uh, most of what has been said, and I'll come to your uh, to your question uh, at the end of my, my short intervention. I mean, I would, I would like to pick up on some of the points that were raised by the previous speakers, and that relate to the to the topic of this uh, session. Were transatlantic relations uh, damaged? From an EU perspective, I think the answer is yes. I mean, Trump's unabashed unilateralism has hurt US-EU relations. He has called uh, the EU a foe, uh, worse than China, just smaller. Uh, you see, I'm trying to emulate his um, gesticulation already. Um, he celebrated Brexit. He has encouraged other EU members to leave the bloc. Uh, he has bullied uh, European allies such as Angela Merkel, embraced autocrats like Viktor Orban. This has obviously not helped uh, the search for supranational mechanisms to enforce compliance with, uh, with rule of law conditions for EU membership. He's imposed national security tariffs on steel and uh, aluminum imports from uh, European allies. He's announced that more may follow. And in fact, in relation to your question, I saw that today the European Commission is, um, has presented a goodwill offer, if you want, to the Biden administration by offering some type of mini package for um, tariff reductions. Uh, so, so that, that is already a, a small widget, perhaps, for, for political negotiation. Trump has subjected the EU to extraterritorial sanctions, I should add, more enthusiastically than uh, any of its predecessors. And so, yes, I mean, US relations with the European Union have become largely dysfunctional. Um, you know, exaggerating perhaps a little bit, um, but this at a time of unprecedented global health, economic and security challenges uh, where, you know, we demand a robust transatlantic relationship. So the state of division and mutual inwardness um, you know, threatens transatlantic prosperity, I think, security indeed, uh, and the well-being of, of Americans and Europeans alike. So can this be turned around um, under a Biden administration? I, I buy into most of what has been said already by, by the previous speakers. Um, there is, of course, uh, you know, a change of tone, which is very welcome, and which will you know, serve as a confidence-building measure, I suppose, in itself. Uh, during the campaign, Joe Biden has emphasized that Europe is the cornerstone of uh, the US engagement with the world and our catalyst for global cooperation. And so his... Uh, first instincts um, could be indeed, you know, to turn to Europe as America's indispensable partner um, of, of first resort when it comes to addressing international challenges. I mean, he is a passionate transatlanticist, as has been noted before. But I agree that, you know, um, what has not been mentioned by the previous speakers is that, in fact, he will be forced to first deal with domestic issues. We've talked a lot about international challenges and cooperation, but the Biden administration's immediate challenge is likely to be, you know, an enviable uh, confluence of crises at home. The, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, deep social tensions, uh, continued recession, um, astronomical levels of government debt. So the U.S. is unlikely to be, you know, the type of consistent outward looking partner that the Europeans, the European Union need and want um, at the same time, uh, if you know the US doesn't beat COVID-19, generate economic growth. So it, it is in, in Europe's interest, I, I suppose, that uh, Biden addresses domestic issues uh, first, because I mean, if America can't help others, uh, or America couldn't help others, you know, if it, if it can't even help itself. And so, um, even if there, there's lots of talk about rejoining the, the WHO, the, the Paris Climate Accord, the Iran nuclear deal, perhaps, um, there will be constraints also on, on what Biden can, uh, can do in terms of foreign policy, constraints of a domestic um, political nature. I mean, he will be constrained by popular uh, demands and a much stronger uh, radical conservative opposition uh, at home. And he has already alluded to the fact that um, 
that there will be no, uh, you know, return to the to the status quo ante. Um, the rallying cry of America first, I think, will remain in all but name. Biden has, has vowed to prioritize investment in U.S. green economy, uh, in U.S. childcare, U.S. education, U.S. infrastructure, over any new trade deals. And he's also called for an expansion of the so-called Buy America uh, provisions in, in federal procurement, which, which has long been an irritant um, in, in trade relations with the European Union. So I think here, um, to, to your point also on, on China and the, the strong bipartisan support, um, perhaps not for decoupling, but at least for a much more assertive line in dealing with, uh, with, with the communist uh, led state, um, will force the European Union to muster, you know, uh, all the all the political will and resources at its disposal to try and carve um, a third way between the U.S. and China. And so, what what the Commission could do in this respect is indeed, you know, related to the question on Slido, which you have posed, that is to to try and, and boost its strategic autonomy in so many fields, not just security and defense, uh, which has been a lot of emphasis placed already, but industrial uh, strategic autonomy, not just reshoring, you know, um, um, the entire medical uh, industry from uh, from Asia and bringing it closer to home, or indeed, you know, installing some type of protectionist um, system within Europe, but, but at least in an, in an open uh, way, as the Commission has proposed, uh, by choosing like-minded partners internationally to uh, to deepen um, you know, the the policy areas which have been prioritised by uh, by the European Union and its institutions and member states. They revolve around the green economy and they revolve around digitization and cyber security. I think uh, those will be uh, the areas that the EU and the European Commission should take um, the lead. Uh, in, in, in trying to, to find, you know, a partner across the Atlantic. Thank you very much, Stephen, for mentioning the poll as well. Right now, the question is, should you still pursue a strategic autonomy strategy? Right now, 55% says yes. Um, I will go to the questions right now, and uh, the first question will be to you, Stephen, because you mentioned it briefly. The question is, how do you think Trump's defeat can affect right-wing populist parties and populist regimes in Europe? Yeah, I think it will um, it will be a boon for for you know democratic uh, forces, um, you know, to, to the Biden victory that is, um, to to try and rebalance you know uh, a little bit of the democratic alliance uh, in Europe as, as indeed globally, and um, you know the Viktor Orbans and the the, the, the Kuczynskis of uh, of Europe they've benefited of course from um, the free pass that Trump has given them and. Um, they will, um, an, an American Biden administration that, that focuses on, on democratic values, on, on the rule of law, um, will, of course, embolden those forces within the European Union that are seeking, you know, to uh, to, to enforce those values and, and, and rule of law mechanisms uh, at, at supranational levels. This is bad news, um, I, I would argue, for the Lilliputins of uh, the EU. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, there are quite a few questions about China, unsurprisingly. Um, and the question is basically, can we now with Mr. Biden in the White House in the near future see any sort of U US-EU convergence on how to deal with China? Uh, I'd like to ask Andres and also Anna on this. Do you think there will be a, a sort of EU-US convergence on China? I think it's uh, well, a good question, but but uh, I would I would answer it um, in in two parts. Uh, first, of course, there is the uh, security uh, um, part of of um, of, uh, of uh, issue um, of, of of the Chinese. Um, uh, well, um, uh, issue uh, and and there I think uh, it is uh, more and more aligned already and, and I would expect that uh, the EU and, 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 the, and the US uh, would uh, continue on, on the path that uh, has already been uh, started. 
um, in, in, um, in, in mutual talks, including the, including the NATO. Uh, regarding trade, uh, of course, uh, it's uh, it's trickier uh, because uh, trade is um, uh, it's, the EU is a, is a large block, China, uh, US, uh, and. Uh, um, and we all remember how we how we looked at the uh, potentialities of, of the U.S.-China deal and uh, what uh, that could uh, have as an impact on, on the U.S.-EU uh, uh, trade relations. So uh, that uh, that is a, a much more uh, difficult question, and uh, I would uh, hope and expect that those issues would be um, would be dealt uh, through. Uh, um, well, uh, WTO uh, um, aligned processes. Anna, what do you say? Do you think there will be a, a convergence, a transatlantic convergence on China on everything from 5G, Huawei, trade and so on? Well, I think there will be attempts at least uh, to a larger extent. Uh, what we have seen this uh, past year has been um, I think uh, discomfort among Europeans to be dragged into a uh, trade war or, or increasing escalation between uh, US and, and China and, uh, and a feeling that we should be able to not, some say neutral, you know, or, or just not be part of that kind of thing. On the other hand, as I said before, I think the, the overall agenda is that we have to decide, are we on the same side in the defense of the West and what do we stand for? And I think that the Biden administration will, will work much more towards this. They have discussed, you know, forming an alliance of democracies, not only US and Europe, but also including the, the Asian democracies in order to, to shape the agenda in this, uh, in this way. And uh, not being less tough on China in the sense of, of uh, getting level playing field and, and getting uh, more free and fair trade uh, in place, but uh, not uh, working so much alone, reaching out more. And I think it's very important that Europe is ready to to work towards such a such an agenda and not not trying to be, you know, hiding in its head in the sand in that sense. And and there comes the issue of the EU has a, the geopolitical commission that Ursula von der Leyen declared and so on. I think that's now it will, we will see. You cannot only work with European autonomy issues. You also have to, to take a stand on where you are in the broader global uh, power game. Can you define and, and can you pursue an agenda where you combine security, technology and economic aspects? That's when you act uh, in a more geopolitical setting, I would say, uh, to see how these, these, these things are connected and to be able to make the hard choices sometimes. I don't think Europe has been there because we have put economy uh, first in, in many senses and let the US handle the other issues. Now, Sweden, uh, if I may go to my own country, made an interesting decision the other week in excluding Huawei from the future 5G network. And uh, we did that. Not many people have taken. Not many countries have taken that strong stance. Actually, I think it placed us with the U.S., uh, Australia, U.K., uh, and it, it, we are awaiting to see what you know. How will that be reflected among the other EU member states? Will that you know? Are we are we forward leaning, and will the others follow, or are we apart and and joining another axis than Euro the European axis on this this issue? I think that will be interesting to to see. But we have done that as a, being, you know, a non non NATO member state, but still weighing in the security aspects that was determined the decision. Thank you, Anna. James, a bit more of a NATO related question, perhaps, or part of it at least. Uh, this question about what do you think about the exchange between Annegret kramp karrenbauer and Emmanuel Macron on the EU strategic autonomy, something we talked about as well, versus US as an indispensable power for the EU slash NATO? And then as a follow-up question, is NATO still brain dead? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we Canadians like Swedes know when there's thin ice underneath our feet. And uh, thank you for pushing me out onto it. But um, <laughs> let me say this. Uh, there is no controversy, I think, amongst most people 
except on the really far extremes, that uh, a Europe that can do more for itself makes sense for Europe. It also makes sense for NATO. NATO can't and doesn't want to do everything. The United States doesn't want to have to be part of everything. Uh, there are uh, issues in Europe's neighborhood that I think any administration would want the United States, uh, in, in the United States, would want Europe to be able to handle. Uh, so more autonomy for Europe, more ability to contribute to transatlantic security. Everybody, I think, understands that that makes sense. But it's also important, as the German minister said, to be realistic. And I think there are some hard numbers uh, that, that just need to be put on the table. These are important questions, and we need to speak openly about them. What we're finding, if you break down the numbers, is that in NATO... 20% of defense spending of this alliance comes from EU countries. 80% comes from the non-NATO countries, including the United Kingdom, United States, Turkey, etc. So the power uh, is not actually in the European Union countries. It's in the non-EU countries in NATO. And if you look, for example, at the um, enhanced forward presence, uh, it is there are four... Uh, NATO battle groups uh, put out a bit, you know, some might call it front lines. Uh, they're led by Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and Germany. Uh, but that's three out of the four are non-EU countries. Um, so I just think it's important that we are realistic about what uh, EU defense autonomy can be without a uh, substantial increase in defense spending amongst the EU countries. Uh, if you go even further, and you'd have to go very far, but what about the nuclear umbrella? But what about what Anna mentioned, which is the willingness to engage heavy operations outside of uh, EU territory? So these are all complications. We just need to be realistic about it. But the NATO point of view has consistently been that a stronger EU that is able to do more things on its own is a good thing. What we want out of that is good NATO-EU cooperation, and we want arrangements in place for the non-EU members of NATO to contribute to, to cooperate with the European Union, and we work very hard, including with the EU, uh, to, to promote that. In terms of brain dead, um, you know, uh, it was, uh, of course, a very widely read article, and it had a, a, a big effect, the interview with, with President Macron. Um, what has sort of flowed from that, I think, is a couple of things. One is a recognition that actually NATO does pretty well, pretty active, has adapted a lot, militarily in particular, uh, even politically. But we do have some internal tensions amongst allies. That is absolutely no secret. Uh, and also, we want to strengthen NATO as a political platform uh, for uh, both sides of the Atlantic to work together. So the Secretary General uh, invited a group of experts to prepare recommendations on how to strengthen NATO's political role. And uh, they're just about finished their work. We're going to have a meeting of foreign ministers in a week or so uh here or well no here i can't say here yes here in cyberspace uh we're gonna have this meeting uh and um and they're gonna present their recommendations and then the secretary general will take those recommendations and then prepare his own uh with that as input um to to allies uh next year so there's a lot of work going on with some concrete recommendations to further strengthen nato's role as a political platform and just to conclude on that answer, I really think it's very important. And it's very important because, as I mentioned, I think as uh, other colleagues like Anna have mentioned, there are systemic challenges underway. This is a group of countries that shares democratic values, but also we share very common perception on what human rights are, what cybersecurity is, uh, what uh, a free and open internet is. Um, so we can use NATO as a platform, as part of this community of democratic countries, including with partners. Um, the closest partners we have, including, of course, Sweden and Finland, 
uh, but also in Asia Pacific, uh, other countries in Europe. We need to use NATO more as a platform for that. And the brain dead comment, I think, has really helped stimulate a lot of thinking, new ideas to help deepen cohesion and um, consultation within NATO. Following up on that, James, as well, because there's uh, another question here about PESCO. There isn't a European event without the PESCO question, as you know. So uh, do you think then that would it be a positive thing if the Biden administration would be more supportive towards unified European defense integration, such as PESCO? Yeah, so um, PESCO, for those who don't follow all these more technical agreements, uh, are, uh, is an EU uh, effort to encourage uh, defense cooperation amongst EU countries. We fully support that, uh, of course. Uh, the challenge from a NATO point of view is to ensure that the non-EU allies can participate also, that they have access to this. And, and uh, I think it's actually not a secret that there was some tension uh, about this. Even my own country felt like the rules weren't clear. It was a little bit uh, exclusionary for EU allies. The EU has now taken decisions on how to engage with third parties. Um, and they have a whole set of rules and regulations for this and how decisions will be taken. Uh, already some on EU allies, if I understand correctly, have participated in some PESCO projects. I think now the rules of the game are clear and the proof of the pudding will be in the tasting, uh, meaning uh, if we can continue uh, a positive trend whereby the non-EU allies can participate in these projects, that'll be a good thing. And I think it's a, a benefit to both sides of the Atlantic for two reasons. One is politically, we don't want a situation in which, as I said, 80% of the defense spending countries in NATO feel excluded from EU projects. But the second is practical. Uh, and that is, these are highly capable countries, uh, very much for that reason. Their companies have a lot to offer. This is high tech cooperation. So um, we believe that this is a win win uh, to have these rules in place, but implemented in a way that all non EU allies can participate. Stephen, can I get your thoughts on PESCO as well? Do you think it's a, it's a good way of perhaps creating some uh, possible strategic autonomy for the, for the EU? Or is it just uh, something that is sort of very popular in the Brussels bubble? No, obviously it, it is very important. The European Union, uh, for all the reasons mentioned before, is able to, as the Americans would say, you know, keep up its own pants. Um, in uh, the immediate neighborhood and for um, the protection of its own security interests and the promotion of multilateral solutions are ultimately in the DNA of the EU itself. And PESCO um, exists on paper, of course. Uh, capability development is being defined in three successive waves of projects which uh, are now being implemented on a modular basis between uh, different groupings of uh, member states. Indeed, I mean, the political agreement has been reached uh, as far as third country participation is concerned. It is heavily conditioned, of course, so as to meet uh, and, and uh, support the uh, security objectives, interests of the European Union as a collective. Um, it's conditioned as well, not, you know, in, in a protectionist stance, um, to shield off, you know, uh, armaments companies and, and the defense industry in the EU itself, um, but for a reason that has to do with uh, with the spending that comes online, managed by the European Commission and its new Director General of Defense Industry and Space, through the European Defense Fund, which is new money basically that has come online uh, through new uh, that will come online uh, through the new general budget. Um, money which is raised by the member states, um, or would not readily, you know, uh, grants uh, such money uh, for, you know, for, for armaments companies uh, abroad without having secured at least uh, a number of uh, commitments um, as to transparency and the support of those um, uh, those inter uh, security interests, as I mentioned. Uh, Norway has, uh, as an EA member full access to the single market, pays into the general budget, and thus already benefited from that access in principle. 
um, we'll have to see now um, how the uh, the legislation will look like once it's published in the official journal to scrutinize, you know, whether or not these uh, exceptional rules allowing for third country participation in PESCO um, are too exclusionary, um, you know, to make economic sense uh, or indeed to make sense in the capability um, development of platforms, which otherwise take, um, you know, ages to, to develop, of course, and uh, for which the European Union will, will indeed benefit, you know, from expertise uh, elsewhere. For the moment, as I mentioned, it's a paper exercise. Nothing is uh, flying, sailing, or, or driving just yet. Um, and so, for the for the success of PESCO and the political capital that needs to be invested in it to keep it going, would be important, you know, in, in the next few years to actually um, launch a couple of these um, these new platforms. Okay, guys, we have about four minutes left right now, which is not a lot. I want to remind everyone to still vote. So far, it seems to be overwhelmingly a majority that the EU should pursue a strategic autonomy. But for you guys now, as a closing remark, the famous last word for you, you get one minute each to look into a crystal ball. We are in maybe 2023, 2024. Uh, there's nothing about the US election, but where are we in the transatlantic relationship? How broken or unbroken is it what would you like to see have happened in the last sort of next four years and what is still to be repaired just very short one minute as a sort of concluding remark for all of you Andres for you what, what do you think what do you 2023 how is it functioning the transatlantic well, relations well thank you I, I think it will be uh, very functioning because as I said we have uh, common values common interests uh, and uh, the strategic goals are quite aligned uh, we will still have uh, our tactical disagreements and, and uh, maybe broader agreements on, on, on some issues but, uh, but still uh, I uh, believe that uh, on both sides of the Atlantic we will uh, um, be working towards uh, uh, nurturing the relationship and uh, not uh, trying to dig into uh, our respective uh, uh, trenches on, on the issues we can't uh, we can't go really Thank you. What about you, Anna? We're here in 2023. Is the transatlantic relations still intact? Well, I hope uh, they are better than they have been, perhaps uh, overall uh, these past years. Uh, I would like us to have moved beyond the stage on. Your uh, strategic autonomy, where the U.S. is grouchy and Europeans are naive. I hope that we have uh, reached a level of, of agreement on on how to move forward uh, on this, uh, and I think that should be possible with the Biden administration. There are so many good signs in this direction, uh, and perhaps a new strategic concept for NATO has has helped in that regard. And also the steps that the EU is taking now uh, concretely on, on developing autonomy in various spheres and a more geopolitical approach guarding its interest. I think that will be useful as well. And hopefully also on uh, China, actually, I think I hope that we have much more of a common agenda that will be very helpful and, and pretty urgent uh, if we are to use the moment we have now of strength, both with the US and Europe in relation to what could be the situation if we do not succeed and we move ahead 10 years uh, within the next decade or so, uh, we will have much more difficulties in handling uh, autocracies such as China. Stephen, what is your crystal ball saying? Well, I think history will not move in a linear fashion and the transatlantic alliance as we've known it is frankly dead. So the temptation that may exist in Europe, you know, to believe that the relationship can go back to business as usual would be, would be mistaken um, and the Biden administration will want to reinvent it, I think, to position each side of the Atlantic, you know, for uh, to cope with, with the challenges of tomorrow, indeed, you know, by 2023, uh, severe health, economic, climate changes, more diffuse power, uh, technological changes, greater insecurities. And so on all of these, um, we would require more Europe. For sure, more European cooperation, and um, I hope that indeed, with the Biden administration, it is more amenable to transatlantic partnership with uh, the European Union. Um, the transatlantic relationship will be reinvented to a certain extent. James, your famous last words. 
I'm not sure they'll be famous, and mostly <laughs> I hope we can all actually meet in person uh, by 2023, which would be uh, great, and I think likely. What I expect is, um, as we have all discussed, a lot of the irritants removed a pretty broad commonality of vision when it comes to multilateralism, the value of multilateral organizations, uh, the value of uh, the democratic West working together. Uh, so actually, I do expect things to be at least uh, easier, but I also expect uh, continuing uh, focus on defense spending and defense spending to be going up, so us to be getting more capable. Uh, but I also expect that the challenges that we are going to face as a community will be uh, enhanced. They'll be more complicated. They'll be bigger uh, because in part because of the effect of, of the pandemic. So we are going to have to stand together. Uh, and I think that that might be a little bit easier over the next four years than it has been over the past. Guys, thank you all very much. We are running late by about 40 seconds. So thanks all for participating in this. You are great. Uh, now, I'm just going to say also that in terms of the polls result, 69% thought that or thinks that the EU should pursue its strategic autonomy strategy. Uh, I have to leave you guys right now. I want some of you, if you want to stay there, it's going to be a musical performance right now. So don't go too far away. Sit down, open the wine uh, and enjoy. Thank you very much.